reading is from Luke's Gospel, chapter 15, verses 1 to 10. Now, the tax collectors and sinners were all gathering around to hear Jesus. But the Pharisees and the teachers of the law muttered, This man welcomes sinners and eats with them. Then Jesus told them this parable. Suppose one of you has a hundred sheep and loses one of them. Doesn't he leave the 99 in the open country and go after the lost sheep until he finds it? And when he finds it, he joyfully puts it on his shoulders and goes home. Then he calls his friends and neighbors together and says, Rejoice with me, I have found my lost sheep tell you that in the same way there will be more rejoicing in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who do not need to repent. Or suppose a woman has 10 silver coins and loses one. Doesn't she light a lamp, sweep the house and search carefully until she finds it? And when she finds it, she calls her friends and neighbors together and says, Rejoice with me, I have found my lost coin. In the same way, I tell you, there is rejoicing in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. This is the word of the Lord. of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to John. Glory to you, O Lord. If I testify about myself, my testimony is not true. There is another who testifies in my favor, and I know that his testimony about me is true. You have sent to John, and he has testified to the truth. Not that I mention human, not that I accept human testimony, but I mention it that you may be saved. John was a lamp that burned and gave light, and you chose for a time to enjoy his light. I have testimony weightier than that of John. For the works that the Father has given me to finish, the very works that I am doing, testify that the Father has sent me. And the Father who sent me has himself testified concerning me. You have never heard his voice, nor seen his form. Nor does his word dwell in you, for you do not believe the one he sent. You study the scriptures diligently, because you think that in them you have eternal life. These are the very scriptures that testify about me yet you refuse to come to me to have life. I do not accept glory from human beings, but I know you. I know that you do not have the love of God in your hearts. I have come in my Father's name, and you do not accept me. But if someone else comes in his own name, you will accept him. How can you believe, since you accept glory from one another, but do not seek the glory that comes from the only God? But do not think I will accuse you before the Father. Your accuser is Moses, on whom your hopes are set. If you believed Moses, you would believe me, for he wrote about me. But since you do not believe what he wrote, how are you going to believe what I say? This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Please do take your seats. Just as the children are returning to their series on identity, so we're returning to what we're thinking about together, have been over these past uh, few weeks, about a month or so, about Jesus and Scripture. We've been looking at places throughout the Gospels, in our Gospel readings, where Jesus interacts with his Bible, what we now have as our Old Testament. And we're thinking particularly what we can learn from the way that he reads scripture, for how we read scripture and interact with it today. And really the frame for this week, I don't know if at the start of that reading it sounded all a little bit esoteric testimony, witnesses and so on. But once you sort of see what Jesus is talking about, I think it's actually kind of quite true to life. The question of how anyone 
sort of in the world, might come to start to accept and to believe in Jesus Christ for themselves. Jesus is basically saying, look, don't just believe in him because he says that he's something special. Consider some good reasons to do so. And he sort of builds up to the big reason we're going to think about today. First of all, he talks about, if you like, just human engagement. So if you see uh, someone who is a follower of Jesus Christ and you see something different about them, it might well draw you in and want to know more. What is it about them that is different? What is it that's giving them a different approach to life, a different sense of priorities, whatever it is exactly? That's kind of how John the Baptist functions. John the Baptist himself says that he's like a giant finger pointing to Jesus Christ. And Jesus says, look, you've sent to John and he has testified to the truth. Not that I accept human testimony. You know, Jesus being Jesus doesn't depend on who John is. But I mention it that you may be saved. John was a lamp, a better image than a giant finger, a lamp that burned and gave light. And you chose for a time to enjoy his light. It might be that you start to look into the Christian faith because you see the difference it makes in someone else's life. That's the first witness or testimony. The second, though, that Jesus talks about is what he says he describes as his works. The works that the Father has given me to finish, the very works that I am doing, testify that the Father has sent me. In other words, don't just believe it because Jesus says he's something special. Look at the evidence for him, the miracles, above all, the, the resurrection, and the way that it, Jesus has impacted history. That can be a way in for someone to start to take Jesus Christ seriously. But the third, and actually the most important and weightiest and clearly in the reading, the most challenging bit of evidence, the reason in the end to take Jesus seriously above everything else is scripture, is the Bible itself. The Father who sent me, Jesus says in verse 37, the Father who sent me has himself testified concerning me. Now, from this verse onwards, Jesus is very critical, in fact, of the religious leaders, the Jewish leaders of his day, for the way that they basically don't take the Bible seriously. And so he, he comes at them very hard. It's, it's a difficult reading to listen to, to read. But underneath that criticism, that attack by Jesus on the Jewish leaders, is a view of the Bible that commends itself, I think, to, to all of us as we listen to it. The tragedy of the Jewish leaders is they had their Bibles open and they thought that that was enough, but they missed its main message. They missed its heartbeat. And Jesus, if you like, is so forceful and direct in this reading because it's a bit like trying to talk to the friend who's falling asleep at the wheel when you're driving with them. You see them going to sleep. You don't just sort of say, hey, can you wake up now? You shout at them. That's kind of, Jesus, I don't think, ever shouts in a kind of way that is kind of anger out of control. But it is that kind of wake up before disaster strikes. That's why he's so strong here. But as you get into what he's actually saying about the Bible, if this is the reason, in the end, the big reason to take Jesus seriously, two, two big things that Jesus tells us about what the Bible is that challenge us and I think help us this morning. The first is that it, the Bible is the Father's word about Jesus. The Father's word about the Son. So verse 37, you, you, you heard it. The Father who sent me has himself testified concerning me. The problem that the, the Jewish leaders have is that they hold the Bible in high regard, but they don't treat it as testimony, as a witness to Jesus. Now that, if that's right, if, that, if what he's saying is that they should be reading the Bible to learn more about him, that's a challenge, I think, to at least two ways of viewing the Bible, which we might find ourselves or aware of. The first is what's clearly going on with the Jewish leaders is that they see this book, or their version of it, the sort of Old Testament parts that they had, as if you like a kind of ethical framework or an inspiring guidebook for life, full of rich and wonderful wisdom. And the danger of that is that they miss something altogether more personal about it. That it is the word of a God, 
as we were just thinking about with the children, who's come to look for us, to find us, and like the sheep, to be put on his shoulders and carried back home. This isn't just a sort of series of rules to live by that will help you live your life well, or a set of inspiring stories, maybe particularly for the children. It is the the message of a God who loves us dearly and deeply and wants to know us. That's the first mistake we can make, sort of seeing it as a sort of slightly standoffish guidebook for life. The second, which might be more common today, is to see it as a sort of a compendium of purported facts, claiming to be a kind of encyclopedia of of, of things to, to learn about the world, which, if we're honest, we no longer find all that persuasive or compelling. That would be, I guess, a, f- a fairly common view of the Bible. It, it claims all kinds of things about the way the world is, about what's, you know, what's, what's really going on, but we can't take this book seriously anymore as that. We've got to put it to one side. But that, too, just seeing it as a kind of a book of you know, claimed facts that we now dispel, that, too, misses the heart of what Jesus thinks this book is all about. Jesus doesn't place the Bible on his sort of bookshelf in the library alongside the encyclopedias or the dictionaries. In fact, he doesn't place the Bible on a bookshelf at all. If you like, he says it's open before us as a letter from someone who loves us and has the deepest affection for us. Now, the Jewish leaders that Jesus is talking to miss that. They miss that personal heart of God. And it's all too easy for all of us to do the same. To think that what really, where we're really going to find love is somewhere else than in these dry, dusty pages. But Jesus says to us, I think he says to the Jewish leaders and, and through them to us, this is where to go to have life, to find life. Which links us, I think, to the second thing that Jesus says about this book. Not only is it the Father's word about Jesus, it's also the most sure divine revelation. Because you see, in verses 37 and 38, those verses I read out, the Father who sent me has himself testified concerning me. That's describing basically what the Bible is, the Father's testimony about Jesus. But then Jesus goes on, you have never heard his voice nor seen his form nor does his word dwell in you, for you do not believe the one he sent. Again, it's a stinging rebuke. But the way the rebuke works is quite interesting because Jesus is consciously, I think, referring to all the ways in their past that God revealed himself to them in all kinds of ways, or at least their their forebears, their ancestors, in direct prophecy. Prophets standing up before the people and literally giving the words directly from God to the people. Or visions, when God appeared in some human visible form, some, some physical, sorry, vis- visible form before them, whether it's Moses in the burning bush or coming down as the angel of the Lord, physical, manifest, obvious appearances of God. But Jesus says, actually, God, God hasn't appeared to these people like that, but he has revealed himself in Scripture. And if they could take this message seriously, what they find here is better than a prophet standing up the front and saying, thus saith the Lord. It's better than even a vision of an angel or a burning bush. Now, it might not feel like it when you open a battered old Bible. But the danger that the Jewish leaders have is that they they are looking for something else other than their scriptures to know that God is really speaking to them, to know what's really going on. And Jesus warns them that they are missing out on the life that is here as they read this message from the Father about the Son. There's a relatively common trope in sort of 20th century fantasy and and sci-fi sort of fiction. It was made most famous, I think, in The Stepford Wives. It's a novel. And it was also made into films, and it appears in Star Trek and all those places. It's, it's It's the idea. It's... It's um, probably slightly old-fashioned now, and I think in a a, a fairly recent remake, they changed the the genders around, but it's the idea that some men in a town or on a planet or somewhere replace all of their wives 
with robots. In the Stepford Wives, they literally do that. And they, they're very, very good robots. They're, they're kind of completely human. They look as if they're human, but they're robots. And the men replace the, the, their wives and take away all the features of their wives that they don't like. And this is where it gets slightly sort of you know, misogynistic. And it, you know, it makes out that the wives are always nagging their husbands and telling them to do things. In um, the Star Trek version, it's one of the baddies, a character called Harry Mudd, takes delight in showing the crew of the Enterprise that he can just turn his wife off, his robot wife, with a, with a sort of switch of a button. So he uh, turns her on, and she starts nagging him in the series. And then he goes, and she's like, and how dare you, Harry? You go, blah, 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 and off. Don't need to listen to her anymore. Now, so it's a trope that appears a number of times, and Stepford Wives is the, probably the most popular version of it. The reason that Jesus is so direct and so blunt with these Jewish leaders is because that sort of idea of the Stepford Wives is effectively what they're doing with God. If you like, they've made their God into a Stepford God who they can turn off whenever they don't want to listen to him anymore. It's a devastating, devastating challenge. You see, because they have said, in effect, we want something else by which we can decide if God is speaking to us, something that we can control, something that we can sort of judge, are we going to accept this or not? They've turned their God into a robot who says what they want him to say to them rather than what the true and living God has for them. It is an absurd thing to think that we can treat God like that. But it is all too common today. And one of the challenges of this passage in particular is that Jesus is speaking to the people who are the most religious of his day. People who are most likely to be found in church on a Sunday morning on a sunny June day. People who are most likely to be standing at the front of churches on a sunny June morning talking about God and pointing people to him. Now, there are all kinds of ways in which this is, if you like, a, a thing that repeats throughout the history of the church that we put something else in between us and the Bible and sort of that stands in judgment over it. At the moment, in the Church of England, the bishops are considering the church's doctrine of marriage and sexuality. It's an enormous question, touching on the most profound and deepest things about what it means to be human. And it's a debate that has torn some churches apart across the world, some Anglican churches, and looks like it may do something similar in the Church of England. As we approach that question of, you know, who are we as human beings, male and female? What does it mean to be sexual? What does it mean to be married? Where is the proper place to experience our sexuality? As we find ourselves in the Church of England disagreeing about that, we have an enormous question. Where do we go to find the truth? How do we get to the truth that we can apply today? It is an, an enormous debate, and I can't possibly summarize it now. In a couple of weeks' time, we're gonna, one of the passages we're going to look at in this series of Jesus and Scripture will touch directly on what Jesus says about marriage and what, he's, what his teaching is. So we'll, we'll be able to unpack it more then, and no doubt we'll be thinking about it as a church over these next few months, because that's what the Church of England more broadly is doing. But here, I think, is particularly a sort of the point or one application from what we're seeing in John chapter 5 this morning, that if we approach any question, whether it's about marriage or about how we use our time, about money, whatever it is, if we approach any question, if you like, with something standing over Scripture to judge it, then we're in the same sort of danger as the Pharisees, that the Jewish leaders were in. And it's not clear where the Church of England will end up as it thinks about these difficult questions. But it does leave me with some cause for concern when 
as the bishops have said on a number of, of occasions, at least one important sort of ground-level principle is that their under our understanding together of what it means to be human and to be married and to be sexual beings should be based on a proper 21st century understanding of being human and being sexual. Now, of course, we have learned so much in the years since this book was written about what it means, scientifically not least, to be human and to be sexual. But if we think that a proper 21st century understanding of anything can replace what we find in these words, then I think we fall foul. We, we must listen again to the warning that Jesus Christ brings to these Jewish leaders. I mean, just think again, the absurdity. How absurd would it be for any one moment in history that humans are come to a belief about something to replace, to usurp, the view of the God of all history. In a hundred years' time, I think my grandkids, or my, maybe my great-grandkids, are going to look back and hear about some of the things that I believed and think that I was ridiculous. Just like I look back on some of the things that my grandparents believe, and I think, gosh, Grandpa, you can't say that today. Perhaps you have that experience. Every generation is always moving its opinions. What will the 24th century say about our understanding of what it means to be human? What will the 25th? Better still, what does God say? The challenge, I think, of John chapter 5 is to come to Scripture not ready to stand over it, but seeking to sit under it, which, as I've said a number of times in this series, doesn't mean ditching our brains doesn't mean ignoring hard questions, doesn't mean thinking very hard about the, whether what we read here is good and true and beautiful and, and can be lived out. All of those things still apply. But the warning of Jesus Christ here, because this is the Father's word about Jesus, because it is the most sure divine revelation, you stand over it in judgment at your peril. I want to say, first of all, that this is a warning to leaders. It's a warning to our bishops. It's a warning to people like me, whose job it is to tr seek to understand and explain and teach Scripture. But perhaps also it's a warning to every one of us as we approach hard questions of our faith, of hard questions of living out our faith in the world. And yet, in the, in the midst of the warning, I can't also help but hear the kindness and love of God. Because this is the word of a loving God to us. It is good news. It's a message of life and freedom and joy and hope and peace and beauty and goodness. I love that we always learn from Scripture in the context of a service of worship on a Sunday. Because we remind ourselves that God is a God of love. And particularly as we celebrate the Lord's Supper, he's a God of generosity in giving himself to us. So please hear those notes as well as the warning. But don't this morning mishear the warning that Jesus has for all of us. Let's be quiet, shall we, and reflect on these words from Jesus today. And then when we've done that for a few moments, Joe Jordan's going to come up and lead us in our prayers of intercession.